I joined church on Wednesday night. And there's, there's nothing that says that we can't have a move of God here on Wednesday night if you and I are in tune with the Lord. Now, if you're sitting there backslidden and bitter and, and critical and away from God and in sin, then, uh, then we need to get right. And that's what the invitation is about as well. But I want to ask you to turn to Genesis 47. And when you found it, stand with me, please, turning there for verse 1 through verse 6 for our scripture reading tonight. God bless you. And as we stand, may the Lord help us to literally stand for God and for His Word out there in the world seven days a week. Genesis 47, verse 1. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And there's a reason for this answer being given, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the introduction. Verse 4, They said moreover, unto Pharaoh, for to, for to sojourn in the land are we come. For thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, Make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen. Uh, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any man, men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. We'll pause our scripture reading there. I'd like to bring to your attention once again verse 3. If you'd like to look at it with me, I'm going to read it. We'll pray. You can be seated. Verse 3. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. Will you bow your heads and hearts with me for prayer? And let's ask the Lord to bless the message to our hearts tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you, dear Lord, that the long-suffering of God leadeth us to repentance. I'm thankful, dear Lord, that you did that uh, before we were saved. And I thank you that you're so long-suffering and patient with us. We read about the children of Israel in the Old Testament, and we think, oh my, what a stubborn bunch they were, what a wicked group they were, what an awful multitude of people they were. And yet, dear Lord, we have a hard time seeing ourselves in the mirror of the Word of God. And when we do, we're shocked. And we thank you for your mercies upon us since we've been saved. And you're putting up with us and even using. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that you do anything with the church of God these days. And Lord, I pray that you would, in kindness and grace and mercy, stir the hearts of the people who've come here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Won't you be seated? Those of you who are familiar with the book of Genesis are aware of the providence of God moving in such a way that a young lad named Joseph eventually became the most powerful man in the world. Second only to the Pharaoh. And during a great time of famine, he had his father and his brothers brought down to Egypt where he planned to take care of them. And in order for them to have some privacy and to have their own land for raising sheep and not to be mingled with the Egyptians all the time, if anybody knew how wicked the Egyptians were, uh, then Joseph did, having lived there and ministered there uh, to them for years. Uh, Joseph told them that when Pharaoh asks you questions about what you do 
He said, you tell them, you tell him that you're shepherds. Now those of you who know your Bibles know that the Egyptians hated sheep and they hated shepherds. They hated anything to have to do with sheep. The Bible says that the sheep was an abomination to the Egyptians. They hated sheep and they, had, they hated anything that had anything to do with sheep. By the way, this reminds us that the world, when it's following its nature, the world, when it's following its nature, unsaved people, when they are following their father, they really don't have any affinity and affection for godliness and God's people uh, either. Uh, they are much more at home at the liquor store or the lounge or the places where people are doing all the drinking than they are, uh, say, in a, in a Bible-believing church service like this one on a midweek uh, night and hearing people say, I'd like you to pray for this one and pray for that one, pray for this one and pray for that one, when they're not used to hardly ever praying at all. Now, Jesus, or Joseph, excuse me, had predicted uh, in verse 33 of the previous chapter that Pharaoh is going to ask you, what is your occupation? And in, uh, in reply, they did as they were instructed by Joseph in telling Pharaoh that they were shepherds. And they asked if it might be possible for them to live in the land of Goshen. And the question of our text that Pharaoh asked reminds us that the, the world really doesn't know what we do. Right. When, they, when they see us, they wonder, uh, what is it you do? I remember in the military when uh, there was a time where I was getting under the gun because I was passing out so many tracks there on the base that, uh, that our uh, officer of our uh, division and our master chief of our division got me uh, together, the three of us, in a room that was used for um, general quarters and we went down there and they started asking me, they said, first of all, they said, you don't drink, do you, O'Neill? I said, no. And they said, you don't do this, and you don't do that. I said, no. And you don't do this. And I said, no. And they finally said, what do you do? <laughs> and I told them some things that I did, which included spending time with my wife. It included going to church every time the doors were open. I said every Saturday I go out with a bunch of guys in the church and we go preach on the streets of some small towns around this area. I've surrendered to be a preacher and I preach every chance that, that I get, I told him back at that, at that in those days. And some people appear to think that what churches do is basically exist so that we can pay the utility bills of those people who are behind out there in the world. And uh, that, that they can call churches and the church will take care of their utility bill. Now you may not be aware of that, but if you were someone who answered a church phone, uh, especially back in the old days of the Yellow Pages, anybody remember that far back? Especially back in the days of the Yellow Pages, when somebody couldn't pay their bills, they'd go to the Yellow Pages and look up churches. And they just go down there, and if your church had a big phone number printed and big bold black letters, you were going to get a phone call. That's right. And, uh, you know, and and it's kind of like it is out here with uh, homeless people panhandling all the time. If you're not careful, you can get hard-hearted uh, about situations. But many people, they have no idea. If, if churches can't pay somebody else's utility bills, what are they there for? That's basically what somebody, some people think. Now, what is your occupation? An occupation in a, in a business is, is what kind of a work or product uh, do you do? And uh, you and I have a work to do. Yeah. You and I are uh, supposed to have an occupation. I don't know if you remember the Lord giving a, a parable about a man going away uh, on a journey. And he said to his servants, he said, Occupy till I come. Till I come. Amen. To occupy means to hold a place and like we said, hold the fort. Right. It's, it's you maintain a standard and, and you keep things going. But to, if a place is occupied, the act of doing that is the occupation. Okay? 
And you, you're there, and you're there for a purpose, and you're there to do something. And I want to talk to you for just a little bit. I'm going to give you a few ideas for you as a Christian. If somebody were to ask, were to ask you, uh, what do you do? What's your church do? What do you do uh, as a Christian? <clears throat> I'm going to give you a few thoughts tonight. We're going to title the message, What is Your Occupation? What is your occupation? But you might could subtitle it, Three Jobs for Every Christian. I'm just going to have three points tonight. I'll give you three thoughts that you and I ought to all be involved in if somebody were to ask you what you are. Have you ever guessed what somebody was by looking at them? Has anybody ever guessed what you were at uh, different <coughs> stages in your life? Anybody ever been asked if you were in the military or asked if you were a congressman, you know, or whatever? Believe it or not, I've had two or three people ask me if I was the president. And depending on who was in the White House would determine how badly I got angry, <laughs> okay, at the time. But people look at you and they, and they wonder, you know, my, my wife, I can't uh, forget to, about this little girl that was tugging on her mama in, in the line at a, at a fast food place we were going to. And, and my wife, you know how she is around children and everything, she's just waving back at the kids and all of that. And so finally the mother speaks up and uh, says something to my wife like, she thinks your husband is the president and wants to know if, he, if she can shake hands with him. So. <laughs> What's your occupation? Uh, what do you look like you're doing? Have you ever, and, and then sometimes it seems silly that you'd even ask somebody. But I'm going to give you three, three F's here tonight. Number one, you should be a fighter. Now, Christian people emphasize love like we did this Sunday throughout just about everything, the messages, the songs, and everything, uh, when we called it Fellowship of Love Sunday. And Christian people should be known uh, as people who love God and who love one another. If, um, if a church is known for bad business meetings, it has a bad testimony. That's right. Because what a church ought to be known for is good business meetings. What a church ought to be known for is sweet services. What a church ought to know. Uh, one of the best things I ever hear from a visitor is when a visitor says something like, I had a wonderful time. People were so friendly to me. I actually sent a note uh, this evening uh, by text to one of our visitors that I send a bunch of you folks that I have uh, phone numbers on. And, um, and they were explaining to me that they just wasn't able to come tonight. The first time they ever visited uh, was on Sunday, and I just sent them a little note anyway. And same note I sent to a bunch of y'all. And, uh, and the lady said, uh, well, I've been up at the hospital all day with somebody, and, and um, I'm, just, I'm just not able to be here. But she said that, um, I, I said, well, I hope I didn't bother you by inviting you. I just do this. Uh, just about every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, I send a bunch of notes out to people, say, let's pray for God to do something tonight. And she, uh, she said, well, no, I wasn't bothered at all by that. She said, and she said, everybody was so kind to me uh, there. So when I, say, when I say that every Christian should be a fighter, you should not come to church. Some of y'all may remember, uh, trying to think of Bob, Robert, Bob Conrad. I don't know if anybody remembers Bob Conrad had this chip on his shoulder. I think it was a battery on his shoulder that he was that, that, many years ago. And some people walk into church with a chip on their shoulder, you know, just wanting somebody to say something to them so that they can say something back to them. Just got a chip on your shoulder. But we should be a fighter. Who are we fighting against? <coughs> we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. I got spiritual wickedness in high places, the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 12, the Bible says in order for you and me to be what we need to be, we need to be equipped to fight in a spiritual warfare. Therefore, the Bible says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Let me tell you that one of the great ways the devil works on you is not primarily the temptations of your flesh. He does use those. 
But the primary way that I believe the devil works on people from the days of Adam and Eve to the days of now is to work on people's thinking. Yeah. Works on people's minds. Making them discontented with what they have. Making them want always to want something else other than what they have. Something better. And the devil will get you confused. The devil will get you fearful. I think one of the things that has been so prevalent among the world for the last couple of years is the devil just having a spirit of fear running through the whole world where people are just living scared all the time. Beloved, Christians ought not to be like that. Christians ought to be courageous and bold. Christians ought to be strong. Not strong in the flesh. Not strong because you're carrying a gun. Not strong because that uh, you exercise. Not strong because that you uh, know martial art. But you're strong in Jesus Christ. Amen. You're strong because you pray. You're strong because you're faithful in obeying God. You're strong because you read the Bible every day. Yeah. By the way, my friend, I, I emphasize this. You've heard me emphasize it. I, I will encourage you if you're saved, read the Bible every day. Amen. Amen. And if you're one of those who are not used to reading your Bible every day, I'm telling you, you're weak. Yeah. You're weak. Amen. And you may have some, uh, some things of fortitude to keep you doing the things that you do, but as far as the devil and working on your mind, you're weak. I suggest you get in the Bible every day. And preferably, I'd say start off the day. The Bible says, with prayer and the Bible. The Bible says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. My friend, if you're going to be a good fighter, and there ought to be something about every church that gives the impression when somebody comes in of militancy, of strength, and of courage for the battle. People ought not to come into a local church and sense that everybody there is on edge, thinking that it's all over. We're about to cave in. We're not going to make it. That's not the occupation you ought to have. You ought to have the occupation of a fighter. You ought to have the occupation and the, and the spirit that two out of the twelve spies had right. when they went to Cain. Amen. Ten of them were wimps. Right. Ten of them went and spied out the land that God told them to occupy. God told them to go there. And ten of them said, we can't do it. Yeah. But there were two who were <laughs> fighters. And they were fighters in faith. What do I mean by that? They believed that God could give them the victory. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even your faith. And by faith, uh, those two men ended up eventually getting into the promised land as they had to wait for 40 years for everybody that was an unbelieving warrior age man to die off. But if you're going to be a fighter, you've got to be enlisted. You need to be enlisted. And uh, positionally, you were enlisted at the time of your conversion. Yeah. Now nobody gets saved by fighting the devil. Right. Everybody who gets saved gets saved because you're a lost, hell-bound sinner. Right. And you hear the good news that Jesus Christ paid for your sins with His blood on the cross of Calvary. Amen. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. When you heard that and believe that message and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, God gave you everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You didn't get saved by doing anything. You didn't get saved by quitting anything. You didn't get saved by starting anything. You got saved, if you're saved, by grace through faith. And if you're, and if you're not saved that way, you're not saved at all. Amen. But once you get saved, you get enlisted. And you may not be aware of it, but you got enlisted. Now, for me, it was February 11, 1968, when I got in the Lord's Army. 
And I didn't sign up, so to speak, uh, but I trusted Christ as my Savior. And being born again, it didn't take too long before I found out I was in a battle with the devil. Right. It's kind of scary when you're a new convert, and then all of a sudden you realize that there's still sin around, yeah. and there's still a devil around. You've been saved, and you're just so thrilled. Hallelujah! Heaven bound! John 3, 16 for me! Right. I'm going to leave the ground one day, the trumpet sound, and go be where I won't be found. Now, heaven bound. But then, along comes the devil and says, well, we'll see about that. Right. And before you know it, you find out you've got a real adversary in this life who while he can't get your soul, he sure can get you discouraged. Yeah. He sure can get your testimony. He sure can uh, get you in some other ways. I, uh, I enlisted in the United States Navy back in uh, 1971 and enlisted there in the United States military. And I was in for four years active, two years inactive, and then I got out. But folks, when you get saved, you join up, and you never get discharged. You're fighting for the Lord until He calls you home. Amen. That's when our discharge is. By the way, let me say that if you're going to be in the battle for the Lord, you need to hook up with an outfit. You, that is, you need to have a local company. Yeah. And that's why that I stress that every believer ought to be a member of a local church. Amen. I believe it will be the right kind of church, but if you're going to uh, let people know that you're saved, then I would encourage every believer, and I've got a little booklet on it, I put, tra put in track form, I believe every believer ought to be a member of a New Testament church. And if you do, uh, among other things, that will convince people that you are really enlisted. Have you ever known somebody to tell you they did something and it turned out they didn't do that at all? Yeah. You ever had anybody lie to you? Yeah. I mean, if you, <laughs> I guarantee you my wife knows who I'm talking about. I had a fellow that uh, was one of our church members that he told us that he was a, a USDT Navy SEAL. He told us he was a Navy SEAL. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And um, to this day, I still wonder if he really was. <laughs> because... <laughs> Because I've pastored some guys who, you know, to me, they'd make great salesmen um, because they could lie real easy. They could lie real good. And uh, they were good at it. But this fellow, he told me he was a UDT seal. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I'm not saying that he was a liar. But have you ever wondered if anybody really was in? And what if, uh, you, you, if I were to ask, say, on a patriotic Sunday, I would ask, how many people here served in the military? And a bunch of people, a bunch of people stood up. And uh, how many were in this branch? How many were in that branch? And then after it's all over, still had somebody standing. And I was to say, well, what branch of the military were you in? And he said, well, I never really joined a branch. I just always fought for my country. And I said, but you wasn't a member of the. Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, you wasn't, a, uh, you wasn't a member of any of those? Oh, no, no, I never, finally, ever, never really did. I just kind of fought for everybody. <laughs> Where were you stationed? Oh, nowhere in particular. <laughs> that's, that's about the way it is when people, you know, claim to be active Christians for the Lord and they don't really ever light into a local New Testament church. The Bible says a lot in the New Testament about local churches. Amen. 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 Local churches have pastors. Right. Amen. And you ought to be following some pastor and his leadership in a local church somewhere. If you're saved, get enlisted and then get equipped. The armor's listed in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. I just, uh, I just uh, this week I was reading on the internet and found out a couple of our People in our church were getting armed to go to, down to the firing range to do some firing. I hope that they're not getting, you know, trying to be a better shot than the other one in case they have to have a fuss. <laughs> but you need to find your weapon and get some expertise right. with your weapon. Get equipped. The armor is listed in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. And then engage the enemy. You are at war. With the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it is primarily fault in your mind. And it's up to you to come out on the other side of victory. 
Second thing I'd like to say you ought to be. What's your occupation? Number one, you ought to be a fighter. Number two, you ought to be a fisherman. You ought to be a fisherman. I'd, like, I'd kind of enjoy that. I mean, I'm doing what I believe God would have me to do. But I kind of enjoy being a fisherman for a living. Now, I think that anything that turns out to be a job after a while, of course, is a job. But I do, uh, I, I do like it when I find out somebody uh, is enjoying what they do. Anybody who is following Jesus Christ has a burden for souls. When a, when a person uh, claims to be following Jesus Christ, they never go so with them. They never have tracks on them. They never leave tracks anywhere. And they rarely speak up for the Lord. I don't believe they're following the Lord like they say they are. <laughs> Jesus said, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Matthew chapter 4, 19. Now if you're going to be a fisherman, let me just give you a few thoughts. Number one, if your occupation is to be a fisherman... You ought to have a plan. By, by that I mean you need a time and a place to go. Again, somebody says, Hey, preacher, you ever go fishing? Yes, sir. When's the last time you went? Well, I don't hardly ever go very often. <laughs> do you remember the last time you went? No, it's been a long time. Where do you go when you go? I can't remember. I just go fish wherever I can. <laughs> you know when you talk to somebody like that, you have an idea. They're not much of a fisherman, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of bait do you use? Well, whatever. Just anything. <laughs> a real fisherman likes to go on a particular day of the week as a general rule. Many times he'll go the same time of day. He has a particular kind of bait that he likes to use. He has a particular kind of rig that he likes to use. And, uh, and many times he has the exact partner that he wants to go with him. And he's got a list of people that he will invite to go fishing with him. I'm talking about a real fisherman. You may be on the list of people he's not going to invite. I've always wondered about that. I went one time with somebody. I never got to go back with him. But a fisherman has a plan. He has a partner. And, if a, and eventually, if he's a fisherman, eventually he'll have proof. Yeah. And what I mean by that is he'll have, a, he'll have somewhere, he'll have either on a wall or on a desk mount or a photograph or at least in his partner's mind where he can back him up, he'll have a trophy fish somewhere. Uh, listen, my friend, if you go fishing enough, you'll eventually have proof that you win. Keep going, and you ought to be a fisherman for the Lord. The third thing I'd like to say is, if you want to know what your occupation should be, if somebody were to ask you, number three is you should be a field worker. A field worker. Worker. On Friday nights when I make my radio program, I also do it on Facebook, Facebook Live, and I'll ask a couple of prayer requests of people on Facebook Live before I get to recording the radio program. And I'll say on Friday nights, tomorrow's Saturday, and I appreciate your prayers for us. Number one, pray for soul winners to go out into the Father's fields from 10 to noon on Saturday. And then, number two, pray for students to get into the Word of God in Bible Institute from 4 unto 7. And we pray for uh, laborers, and you should be a laborer, a field worker. The Father's fields are out there. Matthew 21, 28, Jesus said, What think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Jesus wants you and me to be involved in the vineyard today. I don't know how old each of you are, but I'd encourage you to count your days. You do not know how long you're going to be here. The fact that you're under 20, under 30, under 40, under the proverbial three score and 10 doesn't matter. You don't know how long you're going to live. Right. Our Lord died at 33. You don't know that you're going to live to be 70. Now, you don't know. And so, uh, go work today in the Father's vineyard. Jesus said to the disciples, Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh harvest? In other words, he's saying the, the tendency that we have is to look for a time down the road to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. Oh, if I can just get this taken care of and get this straightened out. No, surrender now. Amen. Surrender now. The Bible says that wisdom is before the eyes of him that hath understanding, but the eyes of the fool are in the, are in the, harvest, are in the 
uh, four corners of the earth. In other words, uh, if you are wise, God will give you something right where you are, and you can see something that God can put you to use doing. If you're a fool, you'll never get around to it. You think, oh, if I just had this straightened out, if I had just this opportunity, then I would serve the Lord. One day it'll be too late. Serve the Lord while you can. Go work today in my vineyard. Let's be prompt. Not only be prompt, but be persistent. The one thing that you and I need to do is we need to be faithful. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2. And then let's ask God to make us productive. Not just, and, and I thank God for every person who's here tonight. Good crowd tonight. Thank God for each one of you. But let's ask God to help us to not just be pew sitters. Right. I want to be a pew sitter in the sense I want to be there, I want to be faithful, I want you to be able to count on me every time. But let's be productive. Let's do something so that when we reach the end of our, our days, that God has enabled us and equipped us to make a difference in this world. Don't you want to make a difference? Don't you want our church to make a difference? Let's go after souls. What's your occupation? What are you busy at? Be ashamed to get to the end of our days. And the biggest thing we were busy at is watching ball games on TV or playing video games on our computers or reading stuff that doesn't honor God. Let's stand together, heads bowed. What's your